I'm Monty Halls, and I'm on a mission to solve some of the greatest mysteries in the world of diving. From the deadliest dive site on Earth... We have a compulsing diver. ...to missing treasure in an African lake... Is there a safe full of gold? ...from Japan's lost Atlantis... It's an extraordinary sight. ...to the most perfectly preserved wreck I've ever seen. This is deep and dangerous diving. It's a really tight squeeze. That will push me to my very limits. This time, I'm in Japan. In 1986, a local diver on this remote Japanese island made a discovery that filled him with awe and stunned the academic world. I've never seen anything under the water like that before, ever. Over some of the most staggering and perilous dives of my career. I'm going to investigate a discovery that could rewrite the history books. Is this Japan's Atlantis? Every so often, an archaeological site of such importance is found around the world that it revolutionizes our understanding of ancient man. How would it feel to discover a lost civilization like Petra or Machu Picchu, the lost city of the Incas? I've traveled to the southwestern tip of the Japanese archipelago to meet a man who claims to have done just that at the bottom of the sea. Yonaguni is the westernmost of Japan's Ryukyu Islands. At 10 kilometers long, it's home to just a few thousand inhabitants. It was off these shores that in 1986, a local diver made his life-changing discovery. I've just come to meet our guide. His name's Mr. Aratake, and he is the man who first laid eyes on this structure. And indeed, in his own right, is something of a local diving legend. Mr. Aratake is a hugely experienced diver but nothing could have prepared him for the sight of a vast stone monument rising towards him from the deep. Aritaka-san, you've uh, dived the monument hundreds of times, thousands of times, but do you still remember the moment when you first saw it? The first photos of Mr. Arataki's discovery were met with astonishment across the archaeological world. It covers 40,000 square meters and stands 26 meters tall. Just who could have built such an impressive structure? And what is it doing here on the seabed? I can't wait for that moment. I can't wait to see it. I've brought my dive team to investigate Mr. Arataki's claims. He's agreed to captain our expedition boat, and we're wasting no time in leaving port and making the three-kilometer journey out along the southeastern coast of the island. The one thing you hear people say again and again and again is that first sight of it just blows your mind. The first sight of it is a moment you never forget for the rest of your life. Although conditions look good on the surface, this is a notoriously difficult site to explore. That's why I've recruited a team of elite divers to help with the investigation. 
We're not going to be able to lock in for very long. We'll be supervised by one of Britain's most experienced expedition leaders, Kevin Gurr. My support divers are cave and wreck specialist and underwater cameraman Rich Stevenson. Ex-para and safety diver specialising in marine archaeology, Andy Torbett. And our main underwater cameraman, Dan Stevenson. There's always a real area of anticipation any time you get into dive a new site. But this is a little bit special, it's a little bit different. It's such a mystical site and none of us really know what to expect. The island lies at the meeting of the Pacific and the East China Sea, at the mercy of competing ocean currents. All right, we're going to be dropping in this area here where there's very low current. Experienced local dive leader Doug Bennett will be joining my team, and he knows just how hard it can be here. The current's going to pick us up and basically pull us right on top of the, on top of the main monument. The guys only know how much current there is when they're actually sitting on top of the site. And Doug's just said that uh, looking at the way the surface is moving, there's boiling, um, there is a lot of water movement down there, uh, which is one of the big challenges of diving this site and surveying it properly. As we begin the dive, that powerful current is working in our favour, pushing us towards the site. This is an eerie feeling. None of us really know what lies ahead. Then, out of the gloom, a strange angular structure rising from the seabed. This is the Yonaguni Monument. It's an extraordinary sight. As the current draws us closer, the true beauty of the architecture here is revealed. Wow! Vast walls, steps and platforms. It's like entering some magical kingdom. <laughs> Amazing. It looks undeniably man-made, but who could have created such a magnificent structure? And how did it end up here? So far, the current's been working with us, but now we want to explore further and we're having to swim against it. We're in danger of being blown off the monument altogether and Dan, our cameraman, is struggling to hold his shots as we get wrenched from the rock. The current's ripping past the monument. This is big ocean movements we're talking here. Going through your air. And just trying to hang on. Extremely demanding. Let's just go with it, boys. Just go with it. Finally, we're forced to let go. As we drift away, we get one last glimpse of the true scale of what gives every impression of being the ruins of an ancient civilization. We're all hardened old sea dogs, but that was truly one of the most magical dives of all our careers. The overwhelming impression is how beautiful it is. 
It's, uh, it's staggering. I've never seen anything under the water like that before, ever. I was waiting for Neptune to pop out from behind a rock at any moment. I really was. Exactly. With his little trident and a fish on the end of it or something. <laughs> it was brilliant. That was knife one. That was knife yeah. one. Adrenaline is pumping amongst my team, but we're on a scientific mission here. Just what is it that we've seen? The big problem you face down there is trying to make a cool, measured analysis while you're essentially being blown around like a leaf in a storm. We've just dived what some people call Japan's Atlantis. Wow! But can this really be the work of ancient man? And if so, how did it end up 25 metres deep on the seabed? It's every diver's dream, regardless of how cynical that diver might be, to jump into the sea, to look down, and there before them lies the lost city of Atlantis. The myth of a city lost to the waves is in fact common to most ancient cultures. In the east, the legend of Mu tells of a whole continent lost beneath the Pacific Ocean. To many, Atlantis and Mu are just folklore, but the stories could be supported by hard science. What we do know is that 20,000 years ago was the peak, the height of the ice age, and then the ice melted, and as it melted, sea level rose. Studies in ancient sea levels show that the monument would have been flooded by the rising waters 10,000 years ago. But that means it must have been built 5,000 years before the Egyptians built the pyramids. Were the ancient people of the island capable of such feats? Before we dive the structure again, I'm going to meet a Japanese professor who's convinced that this is the ruins of a lost city. What I don't want to do is just crawl all over it randomly. I want to be really targeted and look for very specific clues as to potential man-made origins. And I think it's Professor Kimura who can point me in the right direction. Professor Kimura is an emeritus professor of earth science at Ryuku University. He's spent the last 20 years cataloguing and mapping what he's dubbed the Yonaguni Monument. For you, is this the lost civilization of Mu? As well as what appears to be a built gateway leading directly to two huge megaliths, the professor shows me post holes, wide step terraces, and a loop road around the base of the monument. When you get this bird's eye view of the monument through looking at the model here, which is a completely invaluable tool for what we're trying to do, it does seem fairly compelling that this is man-made, this has this uh, the hand of man all over it. So it's a fantastic place to really start a, a vivid visual impression of this extraordinary structure. The professor's studies seem to back up my gut feeling that these are ruins. But I'm surprised to find in the cold light of day that not all of my team agree. It's isolated in an area where everything else appears to be different. There is a lot of straight lines all running in the same direction. It just looks like it's being worked. It just looks like it's been being utilised. See, I disagree. I want to believe. I want it to be fully man-made. Mm. I think it'd be, it'd be great sort of revolution in archaeology and prehistory if it was. However, it could also just well be natural. I might find this hard to accept. But Andy is our archaeology specialist, and he's not alone with this theory. Since its discovery, many experts have argued that the structure is no more than a natural phenomenon. We've now got underwater scooters to deal with that ripping current. 
and a clear mission as we head back for our second dive to find out if this is really Japan's Atlantis or just a lump of rock. Heading back to the site, the elements are still against us. Huge swells have picked up from the Pacific. The problem is we're in the lee of the island at the moment. When we go around that corner, all hell will break loose on this dive deck. We're really gonna rock and roll. These are atrocious conditions. But with limited time on the island, we can't miss an opportunity to dive. It's a real relief to get underwater, and straight away the scooters prove their worth as we battle the current to the first of the features described by Professor Kimura. This is it! This is the entrance to the monument. When you look at it, you can see distinct right angles. Let's have a swim through and see what we see on the other side. It does seem as though we're passing through a distinctly built gateway. And on the other side, we're confronted by two enormous megaliths. These two vast slabs, like Stonehenge, precisely set on their ends. An exact width apart, entirely parallel. And the big argument put forward by people like Professor Kimura, he thinks these have to have been put here by people. The megaliths are impressive, but each one must weigh hundreds of tons. And I can't help wondering, why are they here? As we move up past these distinctive steps and platforms, the features become increasingly architectural. It's like some solid rock fortress. If there's one area on the whole structure that I think speaks of man, it's this one. The right angles are extraordinary. It's easy to imagine large gatherings taking place here on these wide terraces on the top of the monument. What's unequivocal is that these aren't building blocks. This is hewn from the rock, then head all the way. Andy, on the other hand, is still wondering if this has been chiselled at all. Could it really be a natural formation? Ten metres or so below us, he and Kev are collecting a sample to find out what type of rock it is. Dan and I are now 25 metres below sea level at the base of the structure, at what Professor Kimura calls the loop road. This road circles pretty much the whole monument, and it feels like some windswept lane as the current is channeled by the walls. We've got just enough air to investigate a few more features. Could this be a line of wedge holes or quarry marks? Is this a rudimentary carving of a turtle, as some suggest? and what appears to be some form of drainage ditch running across the top of the monument. You can almost imagine water tumbling through this channel and off. With our time running out, Kev uses air from his reserve tank to lift the rock sample to the surface. At the end of a successful dive, this will be a vital clue as to how the structure was created. On a formation that is 250 metres wide, we've seen a whole raft of what do appear to be man-made features. But some experts are convinced man had nothing to do with the Yonaguni monument at all. 
I've invited a leading geologist and archaeologist to join our expedition. He's a professor from Boston University. He firmly believes that what we're dealing with here is completely natural. Professor Robert Schock is going to look at the sample we brought up and tell me why the type of rock is so important. Now look at that. What kind of stone is that? You I can mean, tell me what kind of sandstone. That's a sandstone. Yeah. You can this actually is see the, the granules. That's coming. right, that's right. This is part of the sandstone series that we have on the island. This is a series that has nice bedding planes. In fact, this is probably a bedding plane right here. It weathers and erodes out mm. in nice horizontal layers and it fractures vertically. It's difficult to believe that Professor Schott really thinks this tiny fragment of sandstone proves the monument was formed naturally. But just a few hundred meters from the dive site, he's determined he can change my mind. Look at this. You see that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely natural. What we have is the sandstones here, and they form the bedding planes. You're actually standing on a bedding plane, nice and horizontal. There are fractures, nice vertical fractures, a sets of fractures at approximately right angles. What have you seen underwater? You've seen areas like that where the rock between the two little fractures has eroded out, and you have nice parallel channels. You get this block-like features. Yeah. You get step-like features. We see it all right here on the surface happening naturally. Yeah, that is... It's striking, actually. You can see this. You're looking at the monument. It's a startling twist, and it defies everything I believe so far. Perhaps ancient man really did play no part here at all. But when I think back to our dives, I can't ignore my gut feeling and the sheer abundance of architectural features. Professor Kimura agrees. He claims to know for certain that man was here when the monument was on land. He tells me of an artifact found deep within the ruins that could only have been hidden by ancient man. Potentially, you're touching something that the hand of man touched last time thousands and thousands of years ago. Ah. Wow. Wow. So this is unequivocally man, isn't it? That's the hand of man. That's... At last, yeah. it seems we have tangible evidence of people using the monument when it was on land. Professor Kimura, I'm a marine biologist. Uh, I've dived all over the world and I've never seen anything in the natural world like that before on a reef, on a rock, anywhere. If we know ancient man was here, I wonder if the true origins of the Yonaguni monument lie between the arguments for it being natural or man-made. Perhaps the early inhabitants exploited the weaknesses in the sandstone and modified the existing natural rock formation. Professor Kimura is convinced that another dive will prove that man did indeed dramatically shape the rock. We're all quite excited about this because uh, from what Professor Kimura has described, this, this is hard evidence and I think it could swing all of our opinions. We're all balanced right on the, on the cusp of thinking it is or it isn't man-made. This dive could make all the difference. A kilometre past the main monument, 
This natural rock stack known as the Standing God Rock is revered by the islanders to this day. Professor Kimura claims that at its base lies something truly extraordinary. If we see what we're promised, I may change my mind in the sense that some of this, some of this rock may well be, be man modified. I just can't wait to see this. I really can't wait to see it. Frustratingly, I damaged my ear on the last dive and I'm having to sit this one out. Don't like sending the boys off when I'm not with them. Descending to the seabed, my team heads straight for the entrance of a tunnel, burrowing directly through the base of the rock stack. On the other side, they follow a path leading past a structure very similar to the monument. Professor Kimura thinks this may have been the approach route for some form of ancient ceremony. What would you expect the team to be looking at now? They now cross to an area known as the stage, and it's here that the godlike face carved into the corner of the rock confronts them. and two glaring eyes certainly present an imposing image. Could it be that this face acted as some guardian god, as the Sphinx did to the pyramids? This it may only be a rudimentary carving, but these apparent pupils in each eye do show symmetry in the detail. The pupil is in the centre of that eye, because it's, it's basically 31 to one side and 30 to the other. Right. But um, back on land, I'm surprised to find my team are again questioning if it's been carved at all. With the light coming on it in the correct angle, it really stands out to be a face. If you come <coughs> round to the other side, there's no facial feature recognition whatsoever. If it is meant to be this sphinx-like structure, it's half a job, it's not finished. Mm. Look at the sphinx, and the sphinx is actually you know, a very accurate representation of a uh, failure at the time. But with that, we should play devil's advocate. Again, if the sphinx was underwater for thousands of years in an area of really high energy, yeah, think of the typhoons that have hit that. You can see the surface just above it, the energy it's, would have been smashed to bits. It's intensely frustrating that we just don't seem to be getting any closer to agreement. I still think that this could well be the work of ancient man, but with any tool marks or other artifacts lost to the waves, just seeing a face in the rock really doesn't prove anything. If you build it to look at but I'm not ready to give up just yet. With just a few dives to go, we need to take a radical new approach. Since 1986, when the structure was discovered, what's happened here is people have come here and dived this site. And the statue, the face, they've dived that site. No one's really dived in between or this whole stretch of coastline. I'm hoping the unexplored seabed between the monument and the face may help us understand how the ancients viewed these incredible structures. We've dropped in right on top of the main monument and the current immediately pushes us towards the standing god rock. 
We'll be drifting gently along the coastline for a kilometre, scouring the seabed for clues as we go. Look around me. We're not that far from the monument, but the undersea topography is fundamentally different. It's this low, gently undulating seabed Reefs, coral fish, so beautiful, but it looks nothing like the monument. Before long, great swathes of coral give way to a whole new geology, a huge boulder field. If man was here thousands of years ago, there's certainly no sign of him now. Five hundred meters on, everything changes once again. Huge rocks with a network of almost alleyways and tunnels through them. Perhaps now we're pushing more into the type of geology that would create the monument naturally. With our air running low, we finally begin to enter the familiar landscape of the face and the standing god rock. We may not have found any more signs of man, but for me, the dive has confirmed one thing. The monuments are, and have always been, unique. The thing that struck me was we're 50 meters, 100 meters away from the monument here. Mm -hmm. it, do, it is so fundamentally like different. Yeah, it is. It's not like there's a continuous feature. Mm -hmm. um, just which, out of interest. Uh, which to me doesn't necessarily say it's artificial, but it says it's stuck out. Yes. This is obviously a, a massive geological feature. Will this and finally persuade the doubters that ancient man would have been drawn to these features, even if he didn't create them? It's own right, regards of a little the details we're kind of picking up. A point I'd like to make is something I've found in my studies of very early people around the world is they would work with nature. They would recognize incredible natural mm. features and they would use them. As you say, they would utilize, they weren't stupid. Why create mm. something if there's a perfectly good mm. natural feature there to use and to venerate to whatever they want to do with it? So little is known about the ancient inhabitants of Yonaguni, but I'm more convinced than ever that the rock monuments here played a central role in their lives. The deeper we're drawn into this mystery, the more I wonder just how sophisticated these people really were. When you sit there underwater in those conditions with the fantastic fizz, you just go, wow. It's so striking compared to the rest of the topography around it. Well, go on then, you, yeah. you kick off then. What do you think? I think it would have been a gathering place and a place of importance culturally. Yeah. But the one thing I can't get my head round is if the ancient inhabitants did modify the rock, could they really have done so 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years before the Egyptians built the pyramids? <laughs> Professor Kimura has a theory that the monument may have been on land much more recently. He thinks the answer lies in Japan's notoriously violent tectonic history. Oh. How long ago do you think that happened? 
About 2,000 years ago. So 2,000 years ago, the, the structure, the monument was on land, and then there was a huge event, a violent event, and the earth shook, and a big chunk of the island broke off and slipped beneath the sea and carried with it the structure and the monument, and it's lain beneath the waves ever since. Yes, you're right. Ah. It may seem plausible, but it is just a theory. And as with everything in this enduring mystery, the experts don't agree. I'm just not finding any evidence of what Professor Kimura is hypothesizing happened 2,000 years ago. We need to settle this question of when the structure was last on land once and for all. And my team has found a limestone cave that might just hold the answer. Stalactites. These rock structures form only on land. If they ever end up underwater, they stop growing and are frozen in time. And that moment can be dated. There are two underwater cave systems in the bedrock near the monument. If they contain stalactites, we'll be able to confirm Professor Kimura's theory is correct and finally put a date on when man could have last used this site. But it's a dive that will test our skill and our nerve to the limits. To give you an idea of how dangerous this can be, we've got a choice of two caves we could have dived today. We've chosen this one because the other one's still got three dead bodies in it. A few years ago, three divers entered this cave and didn't come out. Essentially, it's a tomb. So this is something we need to take very, very seriously. This is our last chance for answers. If the cave we're heading to contains stalactites, we'll be able to put a date on exactly when the structure sank beneath the waves. But this is our most dangerous dive. We have no knowledge of the cave system we're heading into. Communication will be essential between the team. If comms fail, we need a backup. Cave diving expert Kev Gurr runs a safety line from the cave entrance. If anything goes wrong, this will be the difference between life and death. I'm not qualified to dive in such a deadly environment, so I'll be acting as safety diver, monitoring my team from the cave mouth. That is not an environment. You can take shortcuts in and you can enter without the relevant experience. And I'm really hoping that in there, as I speak, they're starting to reveal some of the answers about when this piece of land was above water. The cave system turns out to be extensive. They reach a chamber, and from here, several much narrower tunnels branch off in all directions. The team explore them one by one. You can see it's a really tight squeeze. Your buoyancy is going to be perfect. Because if it isn't, you kick up silt and then you turn round to go home. And all you're looking at is a wall of fog. Many, many cave times have been killed by that. They've now penetrated over 100 metres into the cave system. Oh, 
Further into the labyrinth of underwater tunnels, the squeezes are getting tighter and more treacherous. And suddenly, they encounter a problem. We're now an hour into the dive and have used nearly two thirds of our air supply. But I've no way of knowing when the team will return. That safety line is the only sign that they were even here. Then, at last, a light in the darkness. But what news do they carry with them? No, it's Valentine. They've risked everything. But we still can't know for sure when the Yonaguni monuments were last on land or how they ended up on the bottom of the sea. We came here to see if this tiny remote island really could harbour Japan's Atlantis. What we've discovered is that there is an architectural rock structure, and it would have once stood prominently on land. I've been desperate to find proof that man built or at least modified this site long before the dawn of civilization. But the truth is, any conclusive evidence has been lost to the eroding powers of the ocean. What seems certain is that the ancient people of the island, however sophisticated they were, would have lived in awe of the Yonaguni Monument. They were people like us. They were the same species as us. They had as large brains as us. They were as intelligent as us. The true origins of this site may still elude us, but perhaps that is what makes it so special. And in the end, amidst all the uncertainties, there is one thing I'm sure of. Whether it's man-made, man-modified or natural, this would have been a magnet for people. People would have been drawn here, definitely. As they are today.